All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you all for coming down today. We are live from Books and Books in Coral Gables, Florida, so a note for our internet audience watching at home, if at any time during the presentation you'd like to purchase a copy of the book, just call the number on your screen. We'll take care of that for you. We will have the author sign it for you, and we will get it shipped to you wherever you are in the United States free of charge. This afternoon, Books and Books is very happy to present Mr. Ron Suskind and his new book, Life Animated, a story of sidekicks, heroes, and autism. Mr. Suskind is the best-selling author of many previous books, including Confidence Men, The Way of the World, The One Percent Doctrine, and The Price of Loyalty. He was the senior national affairs writer for the Wall Street Journal, where he won the Pulitzer Prize, and is currently the senior fellow at Harvard's Center for Ethics. In this book, he shares the story of his son, Owen. Owen has autism, which now affects an astonishing one in every 88 children. The journey of this particular boy and his family powerfully reveals how, in darkness, we literally need stories to survive. Here to tell us more about it, please give a very warm welcome to Mr. Ron Suskind. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for coming out on the, uh, the day when the Heat are playing a, uh, a crucial game in the playoffs. Um, either they'll either win or lose probably before, uh, before we're, we're, uh, we'll be out of here before they win or lose. Um, you know, this is, uh, uh, this is lovely coming back to Miami. My family lives down here, my brother. Uh, his lovely wife, their kids, um, and uh, there's a scene in the book that transpires down here, 
Uh, this book is uh, Scenes from a Life, Our Life. I uh, have spent a very long time now, I'm 54, so I'm going on about 30 years uh, writing stories, finding people, having them tell me about their life, and trying to craft it into narrative, into stories that are worth reading and say something. And, um, uh, and I've been telling stories since I'm a little peanut. Um, I've never, though, written a book with stories that are so intimate, stories of uh, the most important things in my life, uh, my wife and my kids, uh, my family. Uh, you know, it's interesting because I tell sources, and I've told sources for years, you know, at key moments of our conversation. I say, trust truth. You know, it's all that really works in your life when your life's working. And now a lot of them look back at me and say, oh, no one trusts truth anymore. Certainly not in public. Certainly not powerful people in public life. They trust story. They trust narratives, crafted narratives, message, so-called. But I make the case of trusting truth, that truth is uncontrollable. Sure, it's hard to craft, obviously. It moves like a wind. But it is all we really have. Uh, to nourish ourselves, to grow, to see ourselves clearly. Now, some have trusted it, and they've ended up sources in the book. Some have trusted it, and when the quotes come out in the book, they go, oh, my God, and run. <laughs> Most of them, at the end of the day, say it was for the best. But this is new, because I had to turn the hot lights on myself and everyone else that I know and love Most. And that was extremely um, uh, educational. Um, I have more sympathy for my sources than I ever thought I would earn. Uh, it is a, a process of kind of um, of a kind of a controlled exposure, where all of a sudden you're just out there, and everything is in the book for everyone to see. Uh, and the key is you got to be tough in yourself. I have the, the great luxury of having a wife who is a journalist, tougher than me in many ways. And she is really my co-conspirator on this book. Now, she's always been behind the curtain as my shadow editor on all the books. This is my sixth book. And all the big stories as well. You know, when I'd come in and say, Gus, honey, I don't know how I can write this story. She says, I don't see how you can't. I'm like, okay, you're right. Off I go. Out to slay a dragon. And part of the reason I could do that was because I find of what I was learning inside the house. Now, that's part of the humility of this process, of being humble and opening up your pores and looking at yourself hard in the mirror. And what did we learn? We learned that growth happens for all sorts of unlikely reasons, sometimes the things you least expect. So let me tell you how it happened here. Uh, much of the good stuff happening against our will. So we start out in this book uh, in 1993 in the fall. Now, uh, we are leaving uh, Boston, Massachusetts. I am a young journalist on the make. I am in the Boston Bureau of the Wall Street Journal. Great paper to be at, biggest paper in the country. Those days, it gets about a million eight circulation, pass around, about six million people read every day. And... Um, uh, and uh, Cornelia, my wife, um, and I are full of ebullience. We are moving to Washington, D.C. I'm going to be the national affairs reporter for the Wall Street Journal, which is a, just a terrific gig, you know, a tough job to get, you know, a dream job, you know, writing for the front page of the paper, feature stories. You know, I had to kill 10 people to get the job. It's a family man, nice guys, good guys. Um, I got it. And we get in the moving van, and down we go. I've uh, got two boys. Walter, our older son, is five. And Owen, our younger guy, is two and two-thirds. A few months shy of three. And everything seems to be working just beautifully. And um, we get to Washington, and uh, there's boxes to unpack and a lot going on. And I'm in a new job, and we're living in a rented house in Georgetown, and and my wife uh, notices that something's not quite right with our younger son. He just seems so unhappy. 
And then he's very unhappy, and he is losing, um, seems to be a little out of whack. He's up late. He's not sleeping. And he was a good sleeper. Um, and then he's not talking much. Now, his older brother's a little chattier, but he was a pretty chatty kid. A two and a half, you know, I love you, let's get ice cream, where are my Ninja Turtles? Basic two and a half year old speech, a few hundred words. But suddenly he's not saying much. And then he's crying a lot and he is uh, saying less. And uh, three months in, give or take, he's down to one word, juice. And we just don't know what's happening. You know, we... Uh, just look at each other. You know, I say to her, you don't grow backwards. This, that doesn't make sense. You know, it was like, uh, it was like finding clues to a kidnapping. You know, uh, we now know that, uh, you know, we know many things we didn't know. But back then, we just see, to see him just disappear in front of us. It, it's, it didn't happen. It's different than that. Uh, and then, we first hear the word autism. Now, we didn't know much about autism. It's 1993, early 94. No one knew as much about autism as we do now. You know, now it's everyone gets it. But back then, mostly what we knew was, what, Rain Man. Everyone saw that movie. You know, 1990, 1988, it was huge. So we hear the word autism, and we say, oh, my God, that, that can't be our son. Raymond Babbitt, that Dustin Hoffman guy in that movie, that's impossible. And we are wrestling with denial and despair. Um, you know, and, and, um, and a life that really vanishes almost right in front of us. You know, uh, it's, it's easy to be smug and worldwise and do kind of the thing I was doing up to then as a journalist, you know, which is sum up anything swiftly. Two weeks, I'm an expert. I can sit with leading figures and fudge it, right? Stories on the front page of the journal. Collect all the accolades I could, you know, put them up on the wall. Say, yeah, that's me, right there. And, uh, and then your life goes upside down. And it is, in fact, the beginning of an education. Uh, for all of us. So I'll jump ahead to a couple key moments and then we'll get to some Q&A. Uh, but uh, at that point, uh, we're just mostly confused and frightened. And Owen is silent. Uh, and we're going to every therapist and specialist we can. And um, not much seems to be working. And about a year passes. And we're sort of settling into our life at that point. And our life is at Walt. Uh, pushing six at that point is, is already kind of a junior adult. You know, we don't really sit him down and say something went haywire with your brother, but he knows his brother was there and now they don't really talk anymore. And whether he knows this in some silent place or not, he knows it. Um, Owen is murmuring a little gibberish at this point. Uh, he's saying, juice servos, juice servos, juice servos. Now, it's baby talk. So we're we're kind of hopeful that's noise. That's better than not noise. Um, but we can't make out what he's saying. Just like a teeny baby, you know, you don't know what they're trying to say, um, if they are trying to say anything. And, but we do the one thing we can do together, which is watch videos. Now, Owen, at this age, uh, is of a community of young people who were very into four movies, which were huge. Uh, the Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, and The Lion King. These are giant movies. You know, Disney had a couple of decades in the trough with movies that didn't do very well, and then it kind of caught its rhythm again, rose right back to the top of the popular culture, and these were some of the biggest movies of those years, 89, 90, 91, 92. Well, Owen and his big brother watched these movies before the autism's onset. Uh, and, and we learn about this as we go. It's called regressive autism. It's about a third of the cases. Obviously, Owen doesn't disappear. He's always there. It's always him. But the onset of the autism comes usually between 18 and 36 months, and they lose function. They regress. They seem to go backwards. Um, and, and otherwise, they're very typical and mostly like other kids where the autism expresses itself at birth. Uh, the numbers actually that were cited have changed. I should just digress to say 
uh, from when that press release was issued. It's the CDC report coming out in March show now one in 68 children in the United States are in the autism spectrum, and an astonishing one out of 42 boys, because it's about five to one girl to boy, that is two and a half percent of the male population of the United States. The numbers are similar in other countries. We are at the early stages of this thing. You know, I don't call it an epidemic. I don't know what to call it. No one knows what to call it. But clearly the numbers are very high now. And this is an earlier period when we didn't know what was afoot. So back to present tense. We're up in the bedroom watching a movie. This is the one thing we do as a family. We watch videos. It's one thing we can do. And up here in the bedroom watching these movies, especially The Little Mermaid, Owen seems settled. Now, he's just very unhappy every other way, uncomfortable. But there, just the movie's on, and he's a light. Seems to be calm. We ask our doctors. We've got a nice team of specialists at this point. You know, is it good for him to watch the movies? Every chance he gets, he wants to be there. Well, does he seem joyful? Yeah, yeah, well. He seems comfortable. Yeah, yeah, okay, well. Just keep an eye on it. So there we are. Rainy day, Owen's been silent about a year. Also, he doesn't look at you. No eye contact. And uh, we're watching The Little Mermaid. Now, I don't know any of you see that movie here, The Little Mermaid? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. A classic. Uh, you know, we like Disney well enough. We weren't, like, crazy into Disney or anything. You know, we just, the kids watch the movies. I mean, it's the only thing you can do with them. We watch the movies. We will watch The Little Mermaid many times at this point. And it's the part where Ariel, the protagonist, the heroine, has to trade something to be human. It's a key moment in the movie. And the sea witch Ursula, the villain, says, it won't cost you much, a trifle really, just your voice. Owen hits rewind. Walt is like, Owen, stop rewinding, just play the movie. But he likes to rewind, rewinds a second time. Third time, Cornelia says, it's not just. It's not juice. I say, what? She says, it's not juice. It's just. I said, what? Just your voice. He's saying, just your voice. I grab out one of the bed. I say, just your voice. He says, juice of us, juice of us, juice of us. We all are jumping in the bed at this point. This is what we call our, our uh, Annie Sullivan moment. Uh, Helen Keller, Annie Sullivan. Water, remember that from the movie? And, and it's a moment uh, that's transformative. Owen looks right back at me when he says, Juicer Vos. And, uh, and we feel as though we have broken through. And, um, yeah, hi. Thank you. Um, we go to our doctors and we say, What just happened? And they say, well, look, this is called echolalia. Now, echolalia is just what it sounds like. Folks who lose the ability to process speech, as they do with autism, uh, they, they just repeat noises, sounds. Uh, echo like a parrot? Yes, like a parrot. Like, oh. So here we go between Helen Keller and a pet store parrot. We're somewhere in there. We don't know where. And this goes on for years, pretty much like this. He's getting speech back a teeny bit. You know, two words, three word sentences, like a one and a half year old. And we're trying everything under the sun. And Cornelia is working round the clock. And, and then we have a moment. And I'll tell you about this moment and then I'll read to you a minute, um, a little passage. Um, where uh, uh, Owen is six and a half at this point, and Walter, his older brother, is nine. Now, Walter is grown into this fullness as a junior adult. And the story Cornelia and I tell ourselves, because a part of this book is about story. It's about how we use stories, the stories we tell ourselves, narrative, to make our way in the world. Now, Owen ends up living on stories, but we all really do. And a part of what's interesting about what we learn is not just what makes Owen different from other folks, but how much he is alike 
how much he's like other people, though he expresses it in a more extreme and different way. Well, the story we tell us has about our older son is he can handle anything the world throws at him. You bet. He talks to adults and kids the same. He can navigate traffic flows. He can survive a missile strike. There's nothing that can take down Walter. And, and the key combination is he will never leave his little brother behind. Those two things together, that's the story we want to tell. So, we don't notice particularly, on a particular day, Walter gets a teeny bit emotional on a particular birthday when he's nine years old. But he does. And we are walking back into the kitchen with the cups and the plates with the cake on it, and we're cleaning up from the party, and Owen follows us in, and he looks at two of us intently in the kitchen and says, Walter doesn't want to grow up like Mowgli or Peter Pan. <laughs> it's like a thunderbolt goes through the kitchen. <laughs> Cornelia looks at me like, ah, what just happened? I, I don't know. Owen runs off to some private reverie, our silence becomes four hours where we can't stop talking. You know, what it means like, I don't know, there could be a whole world in there. It's like a window opens. You know, looking back on it, it's like another movie that Owen loved. Anyone here see Aladdin? You see Aladdin, that movie? You see that one? Yeah, it's good. This is just like uh, the Cave of Wonders comes up out of the sand, right? <laughs> Only the diamond in the rough may enter. And then it vanishes that cave into the sand. A little world. There's a world in there. So Cornelia and I, after hours, she kind of challenges me. Now, mind you, she's a journalist like I am with all sorts of interesting jobs, more interesting than mine when we were young. But, you know, once the autism diagnosis hits, she says, I have my job. 24-7, I will be with him. All right. That's four years ago now. So that means morning, noon, and night. And I say, and night. Because he's not sleeping, and that means she's not sleeping. So at three in the morning when he's up and thrashing, she's up. And in the morning with the first carpool to the first therapist, and the school he's in, and then the school he's asked to leave, and on and on and on. And so after a while, she says, look, we need a division of labor here. She doesn't say it quite that way, but essentially that. <laughs> and I know the division too. She can do everything well. I kind of can do one thing well, is that I can be kind of a goofball. You know, I dressed as a clown for the kids' birthday parties. You know, I do imitations. I wear a propeller hat when I need to. So she's like, find a way back in, okay? There's got to be a way. So I crawl upstairs to the bedroom. It happens that Owen is alone in this attic lair where he and his brother live. And, uh, and I crawl up the steps, and I'm there on the rug. Now, he's on the bed flipping through a book, a picture book. Disney, of course. Everything Disney. And he can't read, but he likes the pictures. And we literally have every product Disney makes. I mean, every product. You know, we took a, a second mortgage on the house just for Disney crap. <laughs> and... And, and I'm there on the rug thinking, what can I do? What can I do? And I look over, and here right on the landing, you know how it is with steps up to a landing, I see over there is a puppet. Now, it's a particular puppet, a uh, Yago, uh, the parrot from Aladdin. Now, he's the sidekick to Jafar, the villain. And he's a character Owen clearly likes, because he loves his puppet. So I... Crawl over and get the puppet. Get it up to my elbow. It's one of these big, giant plush toy puppets, you know, 98 bucks. The one up to the elbow, you know. And I put it on, and I start crawling across the rug. Now, the key is to get to the side of the bed without him looking over. This is not as hard as it looks, because he's not noticing you mostly anyway. Or it doesn't seem to be. So I get to the edge of the bed. I throw the bedspread over my head. I push the puppet up through the crease in the bedspread. Up there, where he's sitting. And I talk to him as Yago. Now, this is the voice of Gilbert Gottfried, the comedian. You know who he is? 
Okay. He's the guy, he talks like a busted Cuisinart. It's an easy voice to do. Anyone can do it. So I say, Owen, oh, okay, Owen, how does it feel to be you? And Owen turns to, to the puppet, to Yaga, like he's bumping into an old friend. And he says, not good, I'm lonely and I have no friends. And I just bite down hard under the bedspread. You know, there are male capacities here. Um, it has to do with a muscle right here in the jaw. If you bite down hard enough so that your molars are about to crack, it shuts the tear ducts off beautifully. It's a really, it's a nice physical trick. Because if I start bawling, it's over. And I just say, just stay in character. Okay. What would Yago say next? Okay, okay. So, when did you and I become such good friends? And he says, when I saw the movie, you made me laugh. And I like that. And then we talk. Yago and Owen. This goes on for about two minutes. Until... All of a sudden, I hear Owen start to clear his throat. You know, like, now that he's only six and a half, so it's more like, like that. Exactly. And he says, I love the way your foul little mind works. That's Jafar, the villain. Of course, that's the next line of dialogue. Jafar and Owen talking to each other. I didn't have another line. So I was tapped out. I jump out from under the bedspread and off we go. We begin to speak in Disney dialogue. This is the key. Cornelia and I get together, so we're just going to have to play out scenes from the movies. He seems to have tracked in, laid in all of this dialogue as sound alone. And if we get up and, I mean, if you throw him a line, he'll throw you back the next one. And you throw him the next one, he'll throw you back the one after that. He could go on for an hour. Now, we're not sure if he understands what the words mean. But that's the challenge, to figure out what he gets and what he doesn't. Now, later, Owen explains this to us. He can speak now. I'm giving you away way the end. Things do work out, certainly, better than we might have hoped. He says, when we moved to Washington, I couldn't understand anything you and Mom said. It was all gibberish, gobbledygook. But I love the movies. They, they made me feel okay. And I asked, did you understand the dialogue in the movies? He says, not really, no. But, but they seem familiar, and the exaggerated mo motions on the screen, the emotions and situations and expressions, helped me understand what the sounds meant. There you go. Well, this goes on for years. We called the basement sessions, where we played out scenes from the movie. So, one of the first ones was The Jungle Book, and I'm Baloo, and Cornelius Begir, which is actually nice typecasting, because I'm kind of the goofy live for the moment, bare necessities guy. She's more of the protective and wise panther, watching over him. And Walter, our older son, is King Louie. You know, who says, tell me the secret of man's red fire, man cub. Yeah. And Owen says, I don't know how to make fire. He does Mowgli. But he doesn't just recite it, he sells the line, as they say. You feel emotion under the words. So we're saying, does he feel the emotions, or is he just mimicking somehow those sounds? This is how slowly he begins to get speech back, and he finds a way to find emotions in the sounds, which are words that he gets, and he lives inside of these characters. Now, as he creeps out into the wider world, the challenges grow. His capacities grow, but so do the challenges. And a key moment happens when he's 11, it's about five years later, when he gets into a school. He's been in from around the time of, of Yago to about 11. He's in a school mostly for learning disabled kids and a few autistic spectrum kids, and he's kind of overmatched. And we knew it was going to be a stretch, and it was, but we didn't expect they would ask him to leave, which they did. And we said, look, you said you would educate him, and this is his home, and, and certainly kids like this have trouble with change. But they said, I'm sorry. 
he's out. He's uneducable, certainly by us. We said, look, he's getting better every day. He's using these stories, these movies, as a kind of toolkit. And he did a play at the school, and it was good, but it was a one-off. And, and so he has to come home, and it's a very tough day, the toughest day in many years for us. And he's really bruised, we can tell, but he can't tell us how, because he really can't speak expressively at that point. But what he does is he goes down in the basement, the underground cavern, the Cave of Wonders. And he spends a lot of time down there. It's interesting, he, uh, he seems to have picked up a phrase either from his older brother, me, when he's walking down the steps of the basement, he turns and says, I'll be in the basement, like, hold all calls. You know, <laughs> I'm not to be disturbed. <laughs> Daddy goes... It's like he's working on a project down there. A couple months pass, and I realize, we realize, that he has become an aficionado of the sidekicks. Now, the classic definition, which Owen could tell you, is a sidekick helps the hero fulfill his destiny, or her destiny. There are hundreds of them in Disney. You know, every hero has several. Some are goofy, some are resourceful, some are wise. It's a whole pantheon of them. What's really happening is that Owen is finally seeing the wider world. That, and we hoped he wouldn't in a way. That he's caught in the starting blocks as other kids are racing forward, the rest of his classmates. And he says, I am a sidekick. This is my home among the sidekicks. He gives sidekick identities to kids at a school he's at, many of whom have significant challenges, many with physical handicaps, many autistic spectrum kids with little or no speech. But he finds qualities in them that match those of the sidekicks. This one is sort of gentle, but he's funnier than you might think. And this one, he is wise, though quiet. And he starts to draw furiously with obsession. Obsession. What is that? We'll talk more about that in a minute. But he's got one. And it's these drawings and it's these sidekicks. So he's, he's getting a Disney book and there's a, if there's a sensation he seems to want to feel, an emotion, he'll find that face and he'll draw the face. Exactly. I mean, it's precise. It's like that. He'll look at it, and the pencil will slowly do it just so. And I watch him do this, and I can't believe what I'm seeing. It's like a magic trick, but it's also sort of frightening, because you see that laser beam focus. And then he gets up, and off he goes, and I grab the book. I'm sitting on the rug in the basement. Of course, it's the basement again. And I see that there are a hundred sidekicks drawn. Faces often fearful. Surprised, scared. And at the end, there are two things written in a scrawl, more like that of a kindergartner, but clear, the words are clear. Two things. One, I am the protector of the sidekicks. And the last thing he writes in this book is no sidekick gets left behind. I'm going to read a little part now, short. And um, he ends up in this other school. He desperately wants friends. But social interactions are very difficult for some folks in the spectrum. The complex interactions that are clear to us by virtue of instinct, you know, the way your brow furrows, the way your mouth sits, the context of where we're sitting, who you are, who I am, who we all are, What's happened up to now? What might happen up ahead? That's all context. It's so important for human beings to be able to do that, that the gods of evolution hardwired it in all of us. But in some folks, it's lessened or challenged. And that makes making friends hard. That complex stew of inference and suggestion of us versus not us. 
So he goes to this school with kids who have significant challenges, like he does, and he very much wants a friend. So that job is mostly in the hands of his mother. She decides that she wants to pull together a kind of playgroup. Now, I'll read you this three pages. This kid needs some friends. That's what she says. And then later, Cornelia says this. Listen, we can get a turnout for birthday parties because they're an event, someone's birthday. And clubs at school, they have weekly meetings, Cornelia says, leaning against the kitchen counter. So what if we merge them? She's keeping me up. I want to go to sleep. It's usually the other way around. Can we talk about this tomorrow? Look, look, I have to get to this. This could change things. It could, I murmur. I, it could. She's attacking the social piece, head on, friendship. Her concept is a weekly event, a social, something a few of the boys in Owen's class would have on their schedules for every Thursday night, say, or Saturday afternoon. They'll go bowling or catch a movie and pizza. The activities could change. The kids could decide all together, and the parents would rotate as chaperones. If it was just four or five kids, it would be a once-a-month commitment for a parent. A group makes it special. With more kids, there will be more avenues for interaction, opportunities to try to connect. With the holiday season now upon us, there's so much to do. The Washington Post is full of great activities. So the next morning, she's revved and ready, Cornelia, working the class phone list, calling all the moms. A week later, she's sitting in the kitchen, wondering if her cell phone would break uh, if she threw it. Must have been a dozen calls, maybe more at this point. It sure was a good idea. Everyone acknowledged that. Their kid would be so happy. Let me get back to you. And most of them did, laying out a few problems. Cornelia was sympathetic. They had lives like ours. And many of the moms and dads were working outside of the home and facing a full complement of stressors. Call by call, the brittleness of family life, with kids needing support and parents too, became a theme. Every family was locked in a set of crafted rituals that they dare not break. When one parent drops a son off at a therapy, when the other picks him up, a day reserved for a special family activity, an afternoon when he's already tired, especially with some medication they're just now trying. By this morning, she's cut her hopes and her losses, figuring if she could just start with Owen and one other kid, maybe this thing could grow. Social connections are about finding one's level, a level of comfort or kinship, whether it's the jocks finding their table or the nerds finding theirs at the school cafeteria, or kids in Owen's realm who often will pair up with kids who match their capacity to engage. As his social skills were growing at the lab school, the one he was thrown out of, he found that some of that, building friendships with kids of similar, if slightly stronger capabilities, was a possibility. He was rising to meet them. It's harder to find that at the school he's at now, a lifeboat to kids with a wide array of disabilities, some of them quite severe. But there's one mom left to call, a kid, Philip, who Owen seems to like. He's also one of the more able and interactive kids in the mix. This could be his match. The mom has been away on business, but now is back and taking the day off and is in good spirits when Cornelia calls. They seem to hit it off, which is encouraging, even if it's not all that surprising. After all, Cornelia has cut her teeth on the mean streets of Fairfield, Connecticut, where Catholic dads, many of them commuting to Wall Street, filled large houses with broods of Matthews, Marks, Johns, and Marys, homes with eight, ten, even thirteen children who ran freely house to house, kitchen to kitchen, and then out across driveways and sidewalks to the trusty woods. It was a kid's world. You learned how to get along. And Cornelia did. 
She could tell a ribald story, was voted best sense of humor in her senior class. Her social skills were admired, and her manner, gentle, steady, attentive, had built friendships to last up and down the East Coast. But you live through your kids, a circumstance here that created acute distress for a woman who could always find a friend. Now she couldn't beg, borrow, or steal one for her son. She and this very nice mother, Helen, have been talking all warm and willing for 15 minutes. Every subject is crossed, both telling their stories like seasoned pros, upbringing, college, husband, work, kids, and then the special needs battles both families face. Their life is very much like ours. That's what Cornelia thinks. Like Owen, Philip also has mixed a bit in the mainstream, or with kids with better, stronger capabilities, and has one brother too, a year younger. Helen says they wrestle with the same issues we do, of trying to find ways for the little brother to include Philip, whenever possible, in groups of typical kids. Cornelia lays out her original idea, runs through how it's been a difficult week, and then drops the last card. Actually, she throws it down with a laugh. At this point, if someone just invited Owen over, I'd be happy. Helen pauses. The problem is that uh, the only night that's possible with our crazy schedule is Friday. Cornelia cuts right in excitedly. No, Friday's a great night for Owen. Helen seems to regroup as Cornelia tries to close it. You know Helen. He's always talking about Philip. Okay, he did one time, but that's close enough. No, no, and Philip's always talking about Owen. But, but as I was saying, Helen continues, Friday evening we always have a pizza party with Philip and his little brother and his brother's friends. The line goes quiet for a few seconds. Cornelia's on her knees. But she will not beg <laughs> or speak the words forming in her tightening gut. Would it kill you just to have him come over and eat pizza? Just sit with Philip and his precious little brother and his precious little oh-so-normal friends and just be? He's gentle as can be. He really is. He wouldn't hurt anyone. And we'll reciprocate tenfold. For God's sake, he just wants to have a friend. But of course she doesn't say that. No one would. And Helen shuts the door. So, you see, that's the problem, Cornelia. That one night is already taken. Cornelia's not sure if she can speak. But she does. Right, Helen, I, uh, I understand. So that's the real life. At this point, from pain, from being thrown out of that school, and from becoming an aficionado of the sidekicks, Owen is beginning his response. Quietly, silently mostly. An aficionado of the sidekicks. He gives us all sidekick identities. Okay, on the birthday cards, Hanukkah, you know, Father's Day, Mother's Day. You know, I um, am a sidekick too, as is Cornelia. Cornelia is mostly Big Mama from Fox and the Hound. Anyone see that movie? Probably not. It's not a big one, but you know, she's the wisest and gentlest of the lady sidekicks. Uh, and I, when, on a good day, I'm Merlin from uh, Sword in the Stone. That's, you know, if I get to be Merlin, I, my life is made. You know. and, and I speak in Merlin's voice to Owen, and he speaks to me back as Arthur, and sometimes we switch. Sometimes I say to him, knowledge and wisdom is the real power, my boy. And he nods. And sometimes he says to me, this love business is a powerful thing. We speak in voices. We all have voices in us. We carry them around. We just had to tap them to communicate and express love with our child. It made for a crazy life. By day we went about the typical life. 
undetected. My older son riding his bike to school, Cornelia driving car pulls over hell and creation, I'm out wrestling with presidents in public, in my books. At night we become animated characters. But everything seems to fit together in this world that Owen is building. And finally, we realize something deeper is going on. Because the only person he draws as a hero in any of these cards on birthdays and whatnot is his brother. Because he never left Owen behind. He struggled. He talks about it in the book. It was hard. You know, the first day of school, first grade, new school. They're five blocks from the school. Cornelia, Walter, and Owen in the car. Walt stops the car. He says, let me out here. I'm good. I can walk the rest. Cornelia's like, this isn't Dickens. They know your parents, Walter. No, no, I'm good. Out he goes. This fits into the story we like to tell ourselves of Walter, the junior adult. Nothing he can't handle. A man of the world. Walt explains later when we had to do reporting, real reporting for this book that was hard. I said, Walt, you got to tell me everything, even the things you think I least want to hear. He's like, oh gosh, really? I said, yeah. He's 25 now, out there in the world, working in Washington. This wasn't on his schedule, this book. He's starting out in his life. But of course, he's right there in the mix, and he says, okay, that whole thing about the junior adult, you know, me uh, in first grade, and also, you know, me riding my bike to school, even in the winter. Well, here's the deal. So in, that morning, uh, it was me, Mom, and Owen in the car, just the three of us, the first grade day. So if Mom brought me in, she'd have to bring Owen. And I, I didn't want that. You know, six-year-old boys are a, a cruel bunch. And I didn't want it to be about Owen. Like, what is that? What's he doing? And also riding the bike to school in, in the winter, same thing. But Walt doesn't leave him behind either. And so Walt is the hero. And so when the hero challenges Owen at 14, Walt's 17, Owen's going on and on about the traditional hand-drawn animation, which he loves because he draws coming back, uh, because it's all computer animation since Toy Story, we know that. And of course we're like, yes, Owen, it will come back. You know, we're parents. We say, well... Walt's looking at the two of us. He's 17 at this point. He's like, who are these parents? What are they? Oh, and let me level with you. They put out two computer animated movies a week now. It's easy to do. And you know, you're the only one who cares so much. So, listen. listen. If you want hand-drawn animation to come back, you've got to lead the charge, buddy. You've got to step up. Owen is startled. <laughs> He's never challenged by any of us in this way. It's like, come on, man. Do it. Step up. You got any ideas in there? Walt tells him. We're at the dinner table. Cornelia are watching this. Slack jawed. I mean, you got any ideas? Yeah, you've been watching the movie since you're a little peanut. Come on. Owen looks at Walter. Then he gets quiet. Then he goes, uh, yeah, I, I, got, I got one idea. At that point, we all fall silent. Now, we know how this works. When something's bubbling up, we just shut up. And he says, um, okay, uh, 12 sidekicks searching uh, for a hero. And in their journey and in the obstacles they face, each finds the hero within themselves. And we all clink glasses to Owen's movie. This is where Owen lives for much of his teenage years. A sidekick trying to find his inner hero, the qualities of the hero. Though he says, and says strongly, we are all really sidekicks searching for this inner hero. We don't get redrawn in this life. I'll just finish up by saying that he struggles every day. He has just turned 23. He is an autistic spectrum young adult. The world comes at him in ways that is diabolical, unexpected, challenging him, buffeting him. But he is arriving at a place of awareness. 
he ends up going to a college program with kids uh, starting in junior high, going up through the college age, 21, 22, on Cape Cod. First thing he does when he gets there, he starts something called Disney Club. They don't have one. Now they do. Cornelia and I are up at, at this point, up in, uh, you should write about this. And this is it. You're seeing it now. We're John, we're John Stewart on Tuesday. And, um, and the short version of this is we get up there. I am at that point the writer of residence at Harvard. And we're living in Harvard Square. Owen is at the school in Cape Cod. Cornelia and I drive to the Disney Club meeting in the spring. It's been going a couple months. Uh, and we get there. Owen says we can have parent advisors. Owen, the club is fine, but mostly just they just watch movies and eat popcorn. And we're like, Owen, you're the president of a club. You've got to do something. So after about 80 of these conversations, we uh, drive down to Disney Club, and all of a sudden we see there are 12 kids in the room just like them. And they're all processing their affinity their passion for Disney, just like he does. Now, they haven't lived in this little experimental cell like our house became, where we became animated characters and we had therapists coming in to help to use the characters, to find meaning in them, to hear his scripts and recite lines back to him. But, you know, you feel they're not that different. It's like, for many of them, they have this affinity, this passion, but they were told, like a lot of kids, cut it off. That's the thinking for 20 years. For most of the period since autism is noticed and first diagnosed in the 30s and 40s, many of the folks in the spectrum have these deep passions, these affinities. You know, they live through them. They see themselves through them. They have their identity forged by them. But the view is they're obsessive, narrow, cut it off, or, or use it as a behavioral tool. Meaning say, okay, you like that video, that's your favorite. If you want to watch it again, you got to do 10 things that are like walking across hot coals. Turn it into a weapon. And at that point, the kids, in our, we tried that. We locked the TV at one point because someone was getting up for all night movie marathons. Padlock. You try that though, it shut down. It's like he wouldn't let us back in. He knew they are not honest brokers here. It's like inviting the private equity guy into your company. He's not there to help your company. He's there to sell your company. Okay, so, so, so once we get back in, and we just, Cornelius says at one point, just, let's just enjoy them. Make it joyful. We can't be fixing them every minute of the day. That's not a relationship of a parent and a child. And eventually we are in deep, and we are dancing in front of the screen with them. And the deeper, the better. The more we did that, the deeper he let us in until eventually we were able to shape it into a vehicle. Down in the basement, it was like navigation equipment was down there. And this word means that, and that's really an emotion we all feel. And of course it's happening in the Disney movies. Everything's in those movies. And that vehicle, he now drives into the world and he drives the vehicle to Disney Club. Now those kids at Disney Club all of a sudden start like building their own vehicles. You can see it happening right there. Like, so th everything is in Disney. I wasn't crazy. That's kind of what we tell them. And they're like, we're like, yes. It's like a dam break. Right at the beginning, I say, okay, you know, Cornelia and I have been training for this for 20 years. We're like experts. Okay, which character have you really bonded with? Who's your character? We say to the kids. Okay. <laughs> now, you know, often they'll bond. We find uh, some of the non-speaking kids will bond with non-speaking characters. Pluto, Dumbo who express all emotions without words. And in fact, when Disney makes these movies at the beginning, starting with Snow White, he tells the animators, I want the expressions to be so vivid and so clear that you can understand everything without the sound on. Just a fluke. What could be better for folks with auditory processing issues? So I go to one kid, and he's, he's very kind of shut down, it seems. Very routinized. First thing he says when he sees us, he says... Um, uh, uh, what's your birthday? What, 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 and I said, November 20th, 1959. He says, that's uh, Friday. And there he is right. I ask him, which character is his character? He says, Pinocchio. I'm like, Pinocchio? Why Pinocchio? He says, because I feel like a wooden boy, and I've always dreamed of feeling what real boys feel. 
and I was born, Mr. Suskind, with wooden eyes. And they are hard to see out of. So off we go on this adventure. Disney Club is now in its third year. There are 35 kids in it. Leslie Stahl from CBS was there last month. That's what you saw it, right? Oh, it was beautiful. She became a member of Disney Club. Owen runs it. He's graduating in a month, so someone else will take over, and Leslie is a member of Disney Club. It was wonderful. And I'll just tell you one little twist, and then I'll be done, is that Owen is asked which character, which character he bonds with by Leslie Stahl on camera. And we thought he'd say a sidekick searching for his inner hero because he has a whole philosophy built up. And he's sitting there after a month of this book being out, two months, and the New York Times excerpt, and Owen being, well, celebrated. And he goes, well, actually, um, Aladdin. And Cornelia and I are going, what? I, uh, I feel like a diamond in the rough, a joyous diamond in the rough. A hero, not a sidekick. And, and, and I am more than I appear. Well, that's our little story for today. And the fact is, is that it's a story about all of us and about love and how it's expressed in family. And, um, and I think it's a lot better than the Heat game, but I can't be sure. So thank you for coming out today. Folks, before we go into the signing period, we have time for a couple questions. If anyone has a question or a comment for Mr. Suskind. Yes, to... yes. What, what is your son going to do after he leaves the school, and how functional can he be in the outside? World? So the question is, how, what will our son Owen do when he leaves school in a month, and how functional, what is his functional level? What, what can he do? Um, you know, some of that has changed because since the books come out, the world has become kind of delightfully crazy. Uh, he will be uh, moving, as planned, to a, a community on Cape Cod for adults, usually you know, from their 20s to their 40s mostly, who have various challenges. Uh, they all have jobs, some even drive, so it, it's a, a function level where they have a good bit of independence. Um, and he will move into a house with, which has four, which we are jumping in with three other families, which has four one-bedroom apartments in it. He'll have one of them. And uh, the other one will, one of the other ones will be of his girlfriend, who uh, he has been with for two years. She, a Disney clubber, of course. Dumbo girl. Dumbo's her favorite. It's all I needed to hear. That's the girl for me. Uh, as you know, as Emily, his girlfriend, would say, Dumbo, I say, why Dumbo? And she says, because... Um, well, you know, the thing that made him different made him an outcast, and I understand that. And also he learned that the thing that made him different helped him soar, and that I learned too. So that's why I'm a Dumbo person. What is he actually going to be doing? He'll probably be working in a couple of different places. He'll be working, uh, he works at Marshall's now, department store doing shoes, uh, it's supervised, so, you know, there's a, a boss who looks over him, but he has embraced quite a bit of independence. He does a little sort of session where he draws pictures for junior high school kids at the school, finding out which character they like, and he draws a flawless version of it, and they talk about why those characters are important to each of them. So he might do more of that. It's kind of a Disney therapy or affinity therapy thing that he's kind of working at. Um, you know, he paints now. So he can paint these Disney characters, uh, but with a bit more zip. You know, he paints them because he lives them and feels them a little stronger than even the animators did. And so they have a little more zip. They're sort of like Andy Warhol-ish. They got pop. And so he may be selling some paintings because they're quite good. I mean, his art teacher's like, you can sell these. So maybe he'll do some of that too. He, I don't think uh, he wants to drive. I don't think that's in the cards, uh, at least any time we can see, and um, uh, in the in the near future. And he will he will live his life. He he, he will get federal benefits, SSI and the like, uh, as kids do, young adults do now. But he will. Um, I think um, he's feeling a, he's feeling a burst of confidence. Without any 
facilities like that in Florida? I imagine there must be. Um, I can't say for sure, but there are so many folks out there with awareness about autism and, and social service organizations. I'm sure they're findable. Um, I'm sure they're here. I mean, they're all over the place. How about you? You have a question? Oh, yeah. um, What's your name? I'm Danny. Hey, Danny. Um, my, my, my brother has um, a disability very similar to autism, and he, le and he like, loves to draw. And he's, he, like, you know, like, like write, just write, rant, like, like scribble on, on notepad. Yeah, how old is he? Um, he's um, 13. Is this Danny here? No, oh, that's, that's Kevin. I'm Kevin. Danny. You're Danny. It's Kevin. Yeah. Hey, hey, how are you? You're 13, Kevin? Yes, I am. Hey, how are you? What do you like to draw? I like to draw notepads and and notebook. I like to read books sometimes. We like to write spelling bees. Then he is and I um, was a teenager because I am um, I am very teenager because I am bike now. Wow. So you there's certain things that really really fire you up, aren't there? What are what's your favorite things? What are your favorite he loves bowling. the bowling. You love really? He's actually a really, really? good bowler too. Really? And I bet you know a lot about the bowling alley too, right? Yeah, I like it. Everyone loves it. You're like an expert on bowling alleys, right? That's interesting. You know, it sounds like you've got a lot of affinities, what we call affinities. Deep and special interests that go very deep, deeper than maybe we have. You know what we found is that that like Owen. Now, some things may be hard for you, but the fact is, is that what guys like you build is what I call compensatory muscles. Now, the usual things that someone else might do, that may be difficult, but it's like conservation of energy. Remember that from high school? The energy goes somewhere. It often goes into these special muscles that compensate, often shown through the affinities, those deep interests. And that's the great hope now. Because there are many research scientists, who, having read this book, who are now starting what they're calling affinity research on affinity therapy. Using the special interest, affinity reveals underlying capabilities that might be otherwise shrouded or concealed, and identifying them might lead to better possibilities in the lives of a lot, a lot of kids. And it could be Disney, it could be anime, it could be maps, all kinds of affinities. He, he loves like a lot of different types of animated uh, movies. Car he just loves cartoons in general. And a lot of times, like as he's watching, he'll actually repeat what the characters say as they're talking. You're living our life, Danny. Sometimes he'll like so he just re sometimes like for no reason it'll, it'll be like like repeating it, like you know. So in so their voice, yeah. you know what it's like. You're doing what you're just living our life. And you know we had to learn to speak Disney. It's literally like speak a language. Yeah. You know, and the thing is. Every language is like every other language. Almost every language carries everything in it. You know, joy, love, surprise, it's in every language. That's the exciting thing about this. You know, and the fact is, I have a friend, he's a map guy. His kid's a map kid. Example, he's always like, I wish he was a Disney kid. All right? Because you're like, Disney's a lot, right? Disney's a lot to work with in Disney. Right? I mean, all you guys, you, you can talk, do voices. Well, I said, but, but oh, wait, let's think. There's a lot in maps, too. I mean, maps, what are maps? They're the two-dimensional rendering of humanity, of everything. They're the topography of humanity. Everyone is placed on a map. Every town and every city, the name of it has a history that goes down a thousand feet. You know, maps have the DNA of all things in them. He's like, oh, that's good. Now, later he calls me back and says, oh, let me tell you, new breakthrough. I said, what? He says, my, my kid is now drawing imaginary maps that are mapping his emotional landscape. And then I spoke at NIH in April, and there was another father with a map kid. Hans was his name, and he says, oh, you, you, let me tell you mine. My kid, it was, I think, about 15 He's also a map kid, and he is, uh, you know, Washington. He says he's created animated imaginary characters out of Route I-270 North and the Washington Beltway. I'm like, oh, yeah. Get the kid an agent. That's brilliant. You know, you can imagine the Beltway. You know, it's jammed up during the day. It's very anxious all the time. You know, one little slowdown, God knows what. But this character loves the night. 
when everything's free and open. What's your name? Linda. Hi, Linda. How are you? For my two kids. Yeah. So. And Danny and and Kevin. 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 Okay. Kevin. So in our house, similar to yours. Yeah. There's no question, but that Kevin's hero is Danny. So my question for you is, how did Walter feel about being Owen's hero? No, oh, that's a great one. Well, thank you for asking that. You know, the complexities of the dynamic of hero or sidekick is a beautiful terrain. Um, Walter talks about some of his feelings in the book. You know, there were times where he's like, oh gosh, does Owen have to come to this today? Can we just, can it be a, a day off of that? Um, not that he would ever really want to leave Owen behind, but just, it's just a lot to deal with. You know, always having Owen ionize the air with the special issues that they know in the house. Now, I'll use Walter's words specifically from an interview you can all watch. Walter's getting interviewed now. He's kind of a star in the world of siblings because, of course, siblings are huge. There's almost a million kids on the spectrum in the United States. Now, every one of them has one too many siblings in some cases. And the siblings you hear, the siblings have choices. You know, they go out undetected into the wider world every morning. Then they come back at night into the crazy house, okay? <laughs> and, and so they have options. And in some ways, the readers, many of them, are bonding with Walter because they're like, he's kind of, he lives in our world. So the question of how he feels and what he does is crucial. And it's crucial because the siblings go on the whole full life journey all the way to the finish. We will drop at some point away. So Walter was asked this, about this, on an interview, his first interview on camera on Huffington Post Live. Okay, it's quite, a, you can get it. It's quite a thing to see. Because Cornelia and I are hearing things that we had not heard. So Cornelia and I are on the couch, this sort of young, attractive interviewers here, waltz across at the chair, and you can see they kind of connect. You know, Huffington Post is like a younger online. You know. So the interviewer's like, the kid, I'm going to talk to the handsome 25-year-old guy. And she looks right at him, and he's like, you yeah. know. And um, she's like, uh, so you, there are times where you wanted to leave your brother behind, or you were ashamed of him. Your father wrote that in the book. Tell me about that. It's like, whoa. It's like a shot. He looks right back at her. He's like, yeah. Six, seven, eight-year-old boys, they're a cruel bunch. That's where I had to live, right? You know, it's a struggle. Let's just look at it for what it is. It's a struggle. But, you know, sometime around my teenage years, I stopped asking what if. What if became what is. And Owen and I have a different kind of relationship. I mean, it's not like a lot of brother relationships where we talk about sports or you know, at that point, girls or whatever, whatever. But we have a relationship that's no less than, than those traditional ones. We have a deep relationship. It's just different. And then she hit him again. She says, okay, what happens when your parents die? Then what? And he's like, then what? I see up ahead I'll be 70 and maybe Owen will be 68. He'll live near me and uh, I'll be there for him. And what does Walter say at a key moment in the book? He tells a lot of people who didn't know he had a brother on the spectrum about his real life, a big crowd of people. And he says, you ought to know about my real life and about the best teacher that I ever had. And he's a guy who watches a lot of videos. But what does he teach us? Everything. And he's taught us not to worry about things not worth worrying about. He taught us to trust the things worth trusting. He, he does more in a day than I do in a year with what he faces and accomplishes more. And the fact is, is that we wouldn't wish this on him in a million years, but the, but the bottom line is that I would not be who I am if he wasn't who he is. And, and that is not a blessing in disguise. That's just a blessing. The in disguise is what people don't see. 
That's the truth of it. You know, we are all different. The idea of someone is typical, neurotypical, I didn't even know what that word means anymore. I think soon enough we'll all be found to be on a variety of spectrums. This is one we've identified. There are many of them. I'm on some kind of spectrum, I'm sure of it. And we will see the fact is the problem, the problem we have, clumsy and often foolish that we are. Someday this will be revealed. Is that because there are many things we can't measure. We don't value them if we can't make those comparative measurements. But some of the best stuff, faith, will, adrenaline, hope, constancy, an ability to believe in the, the verities worth believing in, you know, you're not going to measure them on a test. And those are the things that Owen teaches us. He teaches us at the end of the day that we are all sidekicks. We do not get redrawn. And the minute you step up and say, okay, I'm ready. Redraw me as a hero. Is that my good side? No. So you, you're absolutely right, Kevin. That's the minute you go off the cliff. And the key is, on our best day, we find that inner hero. Though ever, ever a sidekick. And a hero helps someone else fulfill their destiny. And that's when we're most heroic. And the beauty of that idea, which Owen taught us, and taught the Disney Corporation for that matter, who were very enlivened by it, is that heroism of this sort, of this quality, is a choice. That's the beauty of it. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, folks. We have Life Animated as well as all of Mr. Suskind's previous books for sale at the counter over there. He's going to be signing over there at the table to the left of the podium. And this was such a compelling presentation. Let's give him another hand, please. Thanks very much.